we've got Kirsty here, who's Director of Sustainability at Leon, and amongst other things, has founded a, a vegan cookie brand. But Kirsty, I'll, I'll leave it over to you to introduce yourself. And I'm um, looking forward to hearing about Leon and what you've been doing to go uh, more sustainable and build a, a brand as a one of the most sustainable food chains. What I'm looking to do is tell you a bit about Leon, um, about how the how the business started and the brand started where we think we're heading, but also very much, to be honest, observations on the current time, because I think it's very hard um, not to talk about that, not least just because food and beverage has been one of the very heavily affected industries. And actually, this is really where we start when you see Leon no longer just a restaurant. This is actually a logo that we developed probably about eight weeks ago now, and I'll come on to explain sort of why. Start right back at the very beginning, actually, because not everybody knows um, how Leon began. So it's actually 16 years old this year, in July of this year. And so what you're seeing in this photo is Allegra McEverdy, who was the chef and one of the three people that founded the business. Benny, who ran operations, and then Henry Dimbleby at the Till, who is of the Dimbleby family, um, but is also himself a trained chef. And then over on the right, it's John Vincent, who was one of the three as the co-founders, but is also now CEO of the business. And he has been for about um, six years. And I think the point here is there was a personal motivation for them setting up, which is they were both management consultants at Bain, actually, but just felt like they were busy spending their time and their energy making other people money. And they wanted to actually work out what their own dream was and what they could do every day that they loved. But I think also it was very much an observation on the time. And we were definitely a nation of sandwich lovers um, 16 years ago. Pret had opened. But there was just this general sense and actually just through their working life, it was like actually not a lot of time to eat. And whenever they did eat, it was a mayonnaise slathered sandwich or it was something a bit crap from a service station. So they actually did what I think any um, good entrepreneurs would do, which was look around at what was very successful. And of course, that was the fast food model. And so they each did, they each kind of went off and did shifts at Burger King um, and at McDonald's to really explore and make sure they understood um, the model um, and the system, if you like, through which fast food was delivered. And then what they did was obviously then ensure that what was served through that model was genuinely different. And a lot of their inspiration came from childhoods that had been full of really gorgeous food, family food, cooking from scratch, but also med particularly Mediterranean food. And this was still sort of when an understanding and appreciation of the Mediterranean diet was really only emerging. But those were very much the themes and the inspiration um, that came through. And just even the whole building of the restaurant was very much around using wood, natural materials, concretes, um, and actually having exactly the same packaging as when they started, pretty much as we have now. So the idea with that was just keeping it very natural, very simple, a bit like the sort of fruit boxes actually that you find in the Mediterranean market just because actually the entire sort of attention and interest and excitement really ought to be when you open the box and you see the food inside and actually the idea of the food being served really really fast has always been really important in the business so there was always a clock on the wall in every restaurant and the ambition really in the model is to serve food in under 30 seconds it doesn't always happen I'm sure someone might have a comment or a question on that but that was the intention and that's been the way that the system set up so when we do food prep for example a majority like a lot of it is from scratch um, but it's fresh prepped and so it's not done to order but it's done to fill the pass so that really when you come along and you take uh, you make your order it doesn't necessarily take quite so long so it did win an observer food award early on largely um, with this idea of being such a strong newcomer and one of the quotes that we most love is Giles Corran referring to Leon as the future of fast food and I think that's something that we've always tried to maintain in the culture um, of the business so in terms of being a change maker, these are just some things that not necessarily everybody knows that the business has done over the years. So actually, when I first joined Leon, which was 2015, I joined as brand and marketing director and it was definitely a boom year. And there were only 24 restaurants, but it was the first time that we there was more investment going into a senior director level team. And actually, it was coming hot on the heels of John and Henry having spent two years writing the school food plan. So this was something where um, they were asked by the government to look at the economics of um, school food for kids, just because there was so much concern around emerging health issues, particularly obesity with children. And so right, they were just meant to write like a point of view. 
but they really went to town. They spoke to 150 dinner ladies up and down the country and they put together a full um, scale plan, which really pointed out that the economics of providing free infant school meals made entire sense. It would actually cost the government less to do that in the long term. And it led to the institution of free infant school meals in 2015. There's also just things like the superfood salad um, and selling porridge for breakfast. And the business was the first really to do in both of those things. And that was as food began to be seen as more functional and the idea of it not, you know, obviously tastes good, but definitely does you good. And the mission of the business has always been around making it easier um, for you to eat well and live well. So keeping those two, keeping that connection as strong as possible. Jamie Oliver obviously has been a real pioneer, but we were the first restaurant that actually supported him on the sugar tax. So we have taxed co the sales of Coca-Cola for quite some time since then. And then I think another emerging thing, for example, gut health and the idea of the diversity of what you eat actually supporting your gut health and this idea of your gut almost being like your second brain and being a hugely influential part of you, your emotions and how your body functions. And then it's not just the restaurants. We do also do cookbooks and we've done 14 of those over the year. And I think that over the years, and I think really that's just a media channel. It's an opportunity to obviously give something to people that encourages more engagement, but just has more storytelling about the business. And Fast and Free, I think, was just one that exemplified the fact that we've always tried um, to put an importance on allergens um, and people that want to eat in a way that's free from certain things in their diet. And that's always been quite an important part of the signage. So as it stands today, we've got 77 restaurants and 64 of those are actually in the UK. And the rest, we've got three or two in Washington, D.C., and we own those restaurants. But the others, large, by and large, are continental Europe. And those are those have been opened and are run with franchise partners. And so that's obviously a real tricky balance, because as much as that can be about an extension of the business, for us, there's a huge importance on trying to maintain the culture of the business. And so an understanding of it above and beyond, you know, what the cost price is on any meat on any meal. But we do also, about a year ago, we launched a grocery range in partnership with Sainsbury's. We also do delivery. And there's a few new things as well that we've actually launched as a result of um, the coronavirus crisis, which I'll come on to. But I think that's kind of broadly a picture. And we're actually, we're in the Nordics, France, Spain, um, and the Netherlands in terms of other markets. And obviously it makes sense for us that we tend to be in high footfall areas. So that be that stations, airports, you know, it's also just a very good way of making sure a majority of people find out about us quicker than if we were um, in a slightly slower place. And actually we were just talking about this before, just as a reminder really, that we are a high volume business. You know, we thrive on volume just because pricing is relatively low, therefore margins are relatively low. And I think initially there was a view that we would try and grow through our owned restaurants. But you know, then you look at the McDonald's story and it's like, yeah, there's a reason that they had so many franchise partners and they actually developed uh, through franchise sites. So that's part of what's informed us for us to do what we've done. So more on to now, and I think everybody has been extremely affected, obviously, by coronavirus, but I think that the food and drinks industry especially. So just sort of as a reminder of the things that are, you know, kind of the founding, the foundation blocks of a business like ours, property is a huge part of it. You know, our, our rental bill annually is several several million and then we have to pay rates on top of that it's also of course staff the availability of flexible lower wage um, paid staff but then of course it's supply chain as well and of course ultimately all of that succeeds because we've got high volume footfall or high demand but when our business started delivery wasn't really even a thing so a lot of our growth was in um, places where there was high office density not necessarily high residential so, of course, the emptying out of offices and the shutting of the city has had a profound impact. However, we, unlike um, many other competitors, we haven't shut. So we actually kept back, kept open 12 of our restaurants and we actually turned them into grocery shops. And it was just as a recognition of the fact that most grocery shops were either shutting, certainly in central cities, or if they were open, they had woefully empty shelves. So we just did that by um, taking a lot of our own produce, which in turn, of course, helped our suppliers. Because we're like, well, we'll keep, we'll keep buying your produce in order to stock these shops. And, you know, hopefully we're also helping people out on the other side of things. 
I kind of really hideously, there was a um, forecaster who talked about them as groceronts. I'm not really sure anybody wants to buy their food from a groceront, but apparently that's what she called us. So um, we had 12 of our restaurants staying operational for that. And to be honest, we also did have a lot of footfall still from the NHS. Um, and that led us on to founding Feed NHS. So we were one of the first to increase our discount for the NHS from 15%, which is what we've always offered, up to 50%. And I, this is a lot, this is mainly what I've been doing through coronavirus is the setup and the running of Feed NHS. So we actually very early on, I took a call from St Mungo's who were putting a lot of their homeless clients into hotels. But again, these were holiday in hotels, so for commuters, and they tended to be in food deserts. So all of the local um, places they might have been able to get food from had shut. So we actually ended up serving them hundreds of meals a day. And in doing so, it became clear, like we have both a system, but an economic model that allows us to serve very successfully at scale, but at cost. So on the 27th of March, we founded with Damien Lewis and Helen McCrory and Matt Lucas, Feed, um, Feed NHS. And the model was um, to publicly fundraise. Um, to push that fundraising through Just Giving and via UCLH and then have it granted out to hospital trusts who wanted to have free food for their staff because their staff was so limited in their other um, options for meals. And so we've raised 1.4 million and we are serving as part of a coalition about 40,000 meals a day. There was a massive learning in our model and what we could do. And actually, I think it's just brought quite a lot of pride um, to the team that have worked on it. Because I think, you know, it's quite a tough time, I think, for a lot of people to go from what we normally expect as, you know, quite high levels of activity, actually, um, down to virtually nothing. So that's kept another four of our restaurants open um, and busy. And then actually, we also pivoted over to e-commerce. And within four weeks from the lockdown, we launched Feed Britain, quite a big name. But it, the idea there was just we are a very connected business. We're very connected to our suppliers. Um, we've got some really highly engaged customers, but a lot of this just came from understanding across the industry. There were restaurant supply chains that were just collapsing um, because all of those restaurants, you know, from high end to mid to low, they were shutting. They, the last thing they were going to do was honour the orders that they put through. So a lot of it, we had suppliers who had had orders booked, but all of those restaurants were defaulting on paying for them. So we launched um, Feed Britain, really it was, we, our ops director actually led the development of this. So this is someone with very limited digital capability, but we took a Shopify um, platform and we now have seven food boxes that we actually fulfill out of New Covent Garden. And again, that's largely because that's a market that fulfills um, an enormous number of orders typically across, across London. So we've got a mix of boxes that are fresh produce and ready meals. And the idea really is that we've just cut out the middleman. So it is restaurants quality food to your door. And so we've now evolved from when we launched, which was fairly focused on London. We've evolved that now to an extra 500 postcode. So it's across the southeast. So again, just huge learnings in what we've been able to do as a team. And I'll be honest, a lot of this just came from the fact that we have a very vocal CEO in John Vincent. And we did do a tremendous amount of PR where we were talking about the challenges of the industry. And in every appearance we did, he just put out a clear call that if you're a supplier, who's got quality produce to offer and wants to work with us, let me know. So that's what I think generated uh, a lot of our ability to set this up quickly. And I think that's just this point really that for us in terms of the, the current situation, lots of businesses closed and obviously that accelerated with the announcement of the furlough scheme. It's like, well, why wouldn't you? Because then you're going to reduce your overhead. You've got some ongoing costs, but the government are going to pay for your team. But that's not what we've done. I mean, I think we've probably kept about 25 to 30 percent of our restaurant teams are still working. And probably I'd say at least half of our support office. We don't say head office because actually we talk about the restaurants as being of primary importance. But 
of the support office has kept working as well. And we found that this has been an enormous opportunity to accelerate a lot of the things we've talked about and we've planned for, like e-commerce, like trying to accelerate click and collect, like trying to actually ensure that we're building more of a future around mobile. We've used, you know, this last eight weeks to actually make sure we're doing that. And also, rather than probably feeling like it needs to come from outside expertise, everybody's just rapidly built their expertise because we've had to. Probably haven't done a perfect job, but I definitely do think it's accelerated um, what we've set up. I'm just probably partway through in terms of introducing Leon and what we've done. And actually, I've got some more points probably to make on just... From a sustainability perspective, this is almost a little bit of harking back to what I thought I'd be doing for um, this year. Because just so you know, I spent three years as brand and marketing director at Leon. I then actually took about a year and a half out um, to do some other things. And I actually only rejoined as sustainability and values director in about February. So I was busy doing my my full year plans um, before, obviously, where they uh, had to completely pivot in another direction. But I think one of the things that we look a lot at is things like the school food plan as well has just developed an understanding of this, that over the last 60 years, that actually the proportion of income spent on food in the UK has more than halved whereas our expenditure on other things like housing and leisure has doubled. So, I mean, we pay some of the lowest levels for produce on food in, in the whole of Europe. And I think we are reaching, we have been reaching, I think, a crisis point on what people genuinely believe is, um, you know, value in terms of what they pay and what they get for their food. And I think that we've only seen this come into sharp relief, actually, with coronavirus, because actually the number of people that are now facing food insecurity is just astonishing. I mean, I'm sure that that is the case, I'd imagine, in a lot of other nations. But I think we had a level of fragility that was probably possibly worse than other markets and so this I just found quite interesting is that a poll this was done um, by the RSA I think in, in um, collaboration with some others and I can share links for anyone that's interested but I think there's just been a general sense of you know kind of local resilience and local connectedness which is one of the positive things to come out of this so a lot of people feeling that they've got stronger bonds it does depend on where you live but I do think there's a lot of people that have been experiencing this. I think a lot of people, largely through being scared by scarcity of food, I think it has though pushed them to reevaluate the importance that they put on it and how it matters. And obviously when we start, started Feed Britain, it was largely actually in response to the fact that the supermarket shelves were, were looking too empty and we just wanted to play a part in supporting the supply chain, but as well as getting um, another means of food delivery to people. What we found now though is that actually supermarket shelves are stocked but people can't necessarily get what they want online so it's been a shifting as people are even less inclined to go to supermarkets but I think there has been a real shift in one in people wanting to cook from scratch or not even necessarily wanting but just doing it um, by necessity and I think overcoming some of the barriers that there might be in normal times and so I think a level of engagement with some fundamentals like food and air quality and time at home I think is a really really good thing and so when we started this year, we actually started um, with a strategy that our, our sort of a rally cry was our wildest dreams. But we kind of added on a version of our mission beyond making it easy for everyone to eat well and live well. We added more to talk about helping people remember their right relationships with themselves, with food and each other. And actually, I think if anything, the coronavirus has accelerated that because I think people have spent more time um, with their food and at home and thinking about it. And as we said, in terms of neighbourhoods, I think that has also happened. Some people, of course, it's been a massive period of stress, so it's not denying that. But I think there are just some positive observations to make as well. And so when we think about food, I think that there is a lot to say around how systematised food has become in um, the structure that we have in the UK, which I think is often more similar to the US than it is to continental Europe. But one of the books that has been much talked about, and I'm sure there's people here quite familiar with it, is the one written by Isabella Tree. It's not about food specifically, but she's just gone on an exploration, largely because also she could with her sort of with her living situation. But that has led to turning back on to what does a rewilded area look like. And within that, what I find exciting is the importance of soil. 
And so there's, you know, a pretty good understanding now that actually you'd have to eat four carrots now to have the equivalent nutrition of a carrot about 40 years ago, which I think is fairly shocking because I think what we found in the coronavirus, in the, in the COVID crisis, what I feel I noticed, and this was again largely because of the profile we raised through PR, a tremendous amount of food that had nowhere to go came our way. I got calls about, you know, ready meals and about frozen sausage rolls and about chicken wings. And I mean, I'm talking in the tens of thousands of items or thousands of kilos of this produce. But the difficulty actually with moving it to the right places was also that it was very fragile. It needed to either be kept frozen or it needed to be kept chilled or it needed to be eaten in a certain period of time. And I think there's definitely something about the over engineering of food that we've achieved but actually fundamentally a lot of our basic produce is not as nutritious as it should be. So in terms of, from a Leon perspective, I think there was a good question that you raised Erica about what might this do for our supply chain? If anything, I think actually we would hope it might just strengthen it because I think about 75%, um, about 70% of our produce is from the UK and from not necessarily large scale suppliers either. We pride ourselves on picking up uh, small, uh, smaller scale suppliers and either helping them grow because they've recently launched or just helping keep their business stabilised. And so I think for us, actually, we had relatively low risk on our supply chain. And we don't have the highest standards. I think this is just a point of worth sort of bursting the bubble that we are not organic. It's an, um, astonishing the number of people that think we are. But I mean, our burgers currently are around the six pound mark. And if we actually had organic chicken, they'd be 11 pounds. And so there's work to be done. And I think that the attitude coming out of this crisis might mean that it's accelerated, which is, again, people thinking about the amount of money they spend for the quality of food that they get. But we tend to prep a lot of our produce fresh. And I would expect there might be some questions coming on about the traceability um, of our food. We are a little bit too analog on this. We have a really high level of confidence on when our, where our food comes from. But being able to be exact about it and fully transparent with the customer, we're not quite there yet. But I think that's where I'll sort of come on to some of the thoughts and, and plans I had at the beginning of the year, which was probably rather than just a transparency on what we've got, also really keen to invest on just how to make uh, the processes that our suppliers use, how to make that better. And so this is, this is a group that are looking to launch towards the end of the year, the Centre for Regenerative Agriculture. But this idea of soil health and setting up the systems by which you can support producers and farmers to work in a more regenerative way, I find really, really interesting because it does largely go back to soil health. And what they mainly assert is that it actually doesn't cost you any more, but it'll increase your yield and therefore actually same cost, but more return. So I think these are the sorts of things that feel very exciting. But the question, I think, is how do you scale it so that with established producers and certainly larger scale producers, how do you get them to recognise that this is these are things and practices that are worth taking on board? And I think there's another piece which is just around the fact that, for example, our chicken, um, we actually don't use chicken breast largely because it's actually quite dry. So we use chicken thigh, but that makes us one of the more desirable customers for our chicken producer and our chicken's British, by the way. But just because we're buying another part of the chicken. So that helps with their whole process of getting the whole animal sold or used. And I think one of the things that has not really been explored anywhere near enough is the byproducts as well, especially in an industry like ours. So we were one of the first to start working as a high street operator with BioBean, who take back used coffee grounds and reprocess them into fuel logs. They take the oils as well and use in various other products. Um, and actually, I'm really interested in the development of um, a startup called Aero Powder, which, again, is just looking at that waste product that comes from chickens, of which there are billions in the world, and they far outnumber us. But this idea of being able to use um, that for building materials or insulation, I find that very interesting. And I think even if we don't necessarily have a direct influence on that, being able to make sure that we can ask our suppliers on well, what are you doing with the other parts of the chicken? How are they getting used? And ideally, it's not just that byproduct is going to animal feed. It's actually going to more long term and sustainable use as well. 
one other thing which i'm just going to put up here but maybe if anybody's got questions about it we could go to it after about two and a half years ago john founded the council for sustainable business that's our ceo and that's just a forum that looks at largely it's looking at biodiversity farming and agriculture just because it is beginning to be understood as a, a contributing about 25 percent of carbon emissions so worse than aviation industry but that was founded really to make sure that there was a more direct line from business to government um, and particularly on how to advise them to um, act on the 25 year environment plan wow. so that's just a really interesting forum um, and actually i've got a role in coalescing food producers and sort of agricultural industry to try and get them to actually accelerate and make bigger commitments of course it was all focused on cop 26 and now we've got a bit more time on our side but the aim is just to continue to move business towards making more positive commitments collectively one of the things that and i think just touching on this because it is a huge growth area for lots of food businesses and now more than ever but i think that there's got to be something about an interrogation of how this trains people to make their decisions because when you look at something like deliveroo and we use deliveroo it's been a crucial part actually of supporting our business in the last two months but the whole basis of the algorithm is time so it's really about time and use and it really does very little to encourage people to ask how that food's being produced and where it comes from and i think that's one of our risks that offsets the benefit of people re-engaging with food and cooking is that this actually just encourages convenience and decision making on, on really the less sustainable criteria so i think these are just two things that when we think about our future, a lot of it really almost going back to that very first picture I shared of John and Henry and Allegra. They were just people that were friends and that had shared interests both in their own lives but in creating change in food. And I think we see huge potential in this, not least because we are more than just a type of food sold in a type of place for a certain price. I think we've always seen Leon as more than that. So my next um, job, which is now more than I think it would have been if we hadn't have had coronavirus, is how do we set up a much more digital based club? Because loyalty schemes and clubs and subscription based models are not something that there is a lot of in lower priced fast food or high street operators, but it's something we're really, really interested in. And so I, there's things, there's models like Green Game, which I just find fascinating because it's nudges and it's kind of, it's a tournament model that works obviously over a certain period of time, but to incentivize more sustainable behaviors, but it is based on obviously an element of competitiveness and therefore groups who know each other will have some connection doing that. So I find that really interesting. And then actually Pin Duo Duo, so social e-commerce from China, finding that really interesting because I think trying to use that model but inject it with some more purpose and I think the emotion that you can expect as well from um, the food industry I think that's um, really exciting has got lots of potential and um, particularly for a business like us so this is just my last slide gosh this is real like this is like I've literally turned my head inside out I think for the range of topics I've looked to cover here but the, I recently, although it, um, launched, it was released last year, I recently watched 2040. And I think just what struck me about that film was it is a new narrative. And I think in a way, I feel really interested in how do you capture the latent opportunity now that COP26 is delayed. Obviously, that's only one forum that happens in one way. But I think that there was always, there's always something that comes out of that, that actually for the majority and for the spectators is just a reminder of the challenges we face. I just don't know that it's optimistic enough and it's future facing enough. Whereas I found the narrative and the positivity in 2040 far more something that resonates, I think, with us at Leon, with the attitude that we take, but with also what I think people really need after we all come out of coronavirus situation with the intensity it's had now. It's obviously going to take some time, but I think that that and obviously being able to capitalise on some of the new behaviours that accelerate the use of new capabilities. And as you'll see, we've got a long way to go. But I think we're much clearer now on where we want to get to and how as a result of the last few years, but particularly actually the last few months. Thank you so much, Kirsty. First of all, Kirsty, how will 
coronavirus change what food companies are doing regarding supply chain? Um, will they be using new technologies? What will be they, they be looking at changing? Will either individual customers or companies be asking for more proof of provenance? Or have you seen any trends in that? I think we will see trends in that, but I think it will just take a little bit of time. Where's my food coming from? Will I get everything that I want and need and how much might it cost? And I think I say this, I suppose, from looking at the feed, the sort of tracking the development of feed NHS. I think we felt a massive sense of, a sort of initiative sense of panic. And I think it's made sense to get an assessment before it began to raise clap carrots. People donate, donate. Um, whereas I think now it will come off of that bit. People concerned about, well, you know, what's the future of my job or my income or when might my kids go back to school? So I think at the moment we're not probably going to get a lot of depth of questioning, but I do think that as we go into summer, um, and as we get into September, where I think people will be looking for the sort of more like for routines as sort a of settle and, and come back more to normal. Mm -hmm. I definitely think we are going to more questioning. And I think from a point of view of how will it change us with our supply chains, it won't change what Leon does dramatically with our supply chain because we actually feel um, very confident in the quality of our supply chain and of our relationships. It will affect, though, the reliability of some fresh produce. It will make sourcing UK fresh produce, I think, harder, just because we've been so reliant on foreign workforces to harvest a lot of our food. So I think that's going to have quite an impact. And I don't think it's actually going to change the transport of produce that much, because if it was going to do that, it would have done that now. So I think the fact that we still import an enormous volume and range of our food to the UK I don't think that's going to be hugely affected. But just back to the cost of thing, people are going to have, actually just through excitement, um, going to be more interested again in the diversity of what they eat. But I think in terms of questioning where it's from, I think it will partly be because they've either invested more time and energy in cooking at home, or, you know, I think so many of us now live in a meal. I mean, I'm pretty much in lockdown with, there's four of us in my house, I've got two kids. And it is amazing how really it is like from one meal to another on some days, because it's just quite hard work, particularly with the kids. So you try much harder to make meal times more, more exciting. But I think also the sort of scrutiny of what you're eating and where it's from is also going to just come from the fact that we are not going to have as many food businesses, I think, on the high street as we've had previously. And some of that's just because I think in sort of the four or five years preceding this, we've really over leveraged our high streets and our retail spaces with food providers. You know, people have had you know, people have had quite a lot of disposable income or credit lines and have used that to dine out much, much more. And I think we're going to see the change in that just because there'll be a lot of restaurant and food businesses that sadly won't be able to survive this. And we are going to go through a recession. So I think for all those reasons, yeah, there'll be, I think, a good level of engagement and questioning. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. I've got to ask this because it says the Crypto Carry Club. Have you looked at blockchain at all for your supply chain? Yeah, we have had a bit of a look at it and it's something that we would probably be interested in for one line of produce. So, for example, it might be something like coffee or something like that, or maybe one of our core supply lines. I think in honesty, we've still just got a little bit of housekeeping to do, though, in terms of across the board. Um, we would probably look to do that first and, I think blockchain, um, and looking at rege like regenerative agriculture practices with some of our key suppliers would be a phase two. Mm -hmm, thank you. And you, you just touched on this about British food, that we be looking to change where you get your foods from. Have you seen any changes about countries that will be coming from or less from China maybe or from smaller suppliers or no changes? Yeah, we, I mean, we get very little produce um, from China. I mean, our huge volume lines are, um, for example, broccoli, which is British for the majority of the season. Peas, that's the same. Green leaf salad it is a mix. It's a bit harvest dependent. So some of that's UK, but quite often some of it's Spain. Rice, our brown rice is actually from Italy. Chicken is a huge volume product for us. And that's always been from the UK. We get that from Leeds. 
um, and fries, unsurprisingly, um, is quite high volume. And those actually do come from the Netherlands. I wish they came from the UK, but just so you know, the reason they don't is just because we have the um, waffle fries and there is no um, waffle fry machine, as in that turns the potatoes to the waffle cut fries in the UK. And so much as we consistently try and persuade our supply partner to get a buyer machine for the UK, the nearest one is the Netherlands. So our potatoes come from there. So I don't know, not a tremendous, no, we wouldn't expect a tremendous amount of change. I mean, we have been having conversations for a while about what more can we do for food sourcing in avocado, um, because that's higher risk, you know, it's a, quite a problematic produce. But I don't, the coronavirus won't really change that. We've been having those discussions for months. So I don't know that we, we're in a lucky position, I think, where our supply chain is quite good. What are one or two or three big behaviour shifts within... get food to people and I think that we definitely delivery has been something um, that everybody's become very obsessed about because it's an ideal way to just keep your kitchens functioning your supply chains live some of your staff in business I think it's actually just been more though that we've seen some of the key delivery channels like delivery suffer massively just because they're very reliant on um, staff and actually a lot of their staff chose not to work or indeed left the country at the beginning of the lockdown. So I think that will end up stabilising. I think, yeah, an increased um, use of e-commerce and trying to sort that out, I think is definitely um, one of the big changes. And I think also like I was saying, trying people being more a bit more adventurous I think around the type of produce they might be buying and their willingness to try different means to cook them um, because you know we've seen a tremendous increase in cook-alongs I mean all sorts of business I think Pret has even done a cook-along you know there's all sorts of businesses offering cook-alongs and kind of trying to generate discussion around cooking at home that never would have done that otherwise so I think those are probably the main things what food trends are coming? That's a really interesting one. For me, I think, um, I definitely think there's going to be a little bit of education around vegan and meat replacement. Not because, I mean, I, th I think vegan is a very positive thing, but I do think that there are a lot of products that have come on the market where vegan is seen as a proxy for healthier. And that's not really the case because actually quite a lot of vegan products can be really quite heavily processed, can be quite high in salt content. So I do think that is going to be a discussion and an interesting one, I think, to have, because I think the potential um, for veganism and vegan products is huge, which is really exciting because I think everybody knows if you're engaged in this at all, that we need to drastically reduce our meat consumption. I really hope that there is a renewed discussion around the quality um, of meat product. Um, where is it from and how has it been treated? Because I think there's, you know, there's still so many clears over that. I would still really hope as well just to see an increase in people looking for non-dairy milk products as well. I think that would be good. And I think, yeah, just a renewed interest in British fresh produce, because I think that, you know, there's just been more in the news around the challenges that farmers are going to face. And I think the trend I would love to see happen is just put people putting more importance on British farmers because I think they've often been demonised and seen as backward looking and problematic and standing in the way of change. But I think at a time like this, the fact that actually they've still been able to supply produce, that's been crucially important. And I hope that there's a re-engagement with that. If you're starting up as a food entrepreneur, are there areas worth looking into? Oh, what would I say on this? So I think, oh yeah, okay. So I think there's, there's a business I really love. They're actually Israeli and they're called InFarm. Now, I don't believe like George Monbiot does that like a kind of vertical farming is the only way to go. I don't believe in that. I think there's a huge dignity in people working on the land and being farmers in rural spaces. I think we have to keep that. It's part of our entire heritage. So I don't agree that that's just going to go and the environmental land management um, and land use subsidies are going to just help our entire rural spaces become places of, you know, uh, places of leisure. But I do think their model's really interesting. And I think that they, because they have got a very modular system for the vertical growing in InFarm, and so they're able to place it both in restaurants and supermarkets um, and do that. And we looked at it early on, but unfortunately for us, um, it was just too costly to have any of their units in our areas. 
But I do think that actually, I think just continuing to find alternative green veg. So I'm really fascinated by the seaweed industry and the fact that that's really low level and it's really just people harvesting seaweed from wild places. But actually about 18 months ago, a farm up in Scotland got the first proper subsidy in the UK, ironically from the EU, but to actually explore how to seaweed farm at scale because there is very, very limited seaweed farming in Europe. Most of it still actually is just done in Asia and maybe in part in, in North America. But I find products like mussels, which are high in protein and quite sustainable to produce, and seaweed, I, I think are fascinating. Has the nutritional content of any food types increased with the advent of modern farming methods? Okay, so no, in the honest answer, no. So I don't know if anybody's read Homo sapiens. I've just found it a fascinating read. I mean, it's a few years old now, I think. But just one of the, they sort of talk about what the, all the advancements that came um, with modern agriculture, but all of the regressions we had as well. And I think a huge one of them, that industrial farming has done very little for the nutritional value of our food. If anything, really, it's just decreased it. And I think that Isabella Tree um, point just supports that. There's a lot out there about this. It doesn't, some of it's farming methods, but it's largely those farming methods and their impact on soil health. Because anything that you do to try and accelerate the growth of produce that grows and of course, like the, you know, chickens um, and any animals and their development, everything we do is trying to accelerate their growth and increase the yield. And when we are doing it, when we're doing it in ways that are artificial, all it does is increase yield, but decrease the nutrition. And that's why then you kind of have the marketing industry comes into play and tells you all these things about amazing, how amazingly fortified your food might be, which I just find ironic because in the end, while, while it might be fortified, it's still nutritionally likely uh, to be less good. So, I mean, there's some really interesting things like there's a business called Hodmadod, which is exploring the resurgence of pul like native pulses and grains in the UK. And things like that are really interesting because, of course, also the more you farmed off certain seeds and you genetically modified them, the less nutritional they become. But I think ideas like Hodmadod to explore heritage grains is a really interesting one because they naturally have much higher nutritional content. If you could only cook from one Leon cookbook, oh, I'm really biased. So I would say fast and free, but that is not necessarily because it's the best. It's just because I find it a very creative cookbook. I think it kind of helps you leap beyond what you might find some of the limitations of vegan cooking or gluten-free cooking. But it is also the first cookbook that I worked on. And so we all went down in 2015, I think it was, we all went down to Dorset for a week and we all stayed there and we made all the food and we photographed it. And it really, it was like something out of an ironic movie, actually. I took my kids and we all, you know, hung out and camped, but it was pretty idyllic. But a majority of them are good. And I think some of the early ones have more narrative to them. So I think Family and Friends, and actually the very first one, they're just a really good read and they're sort of quite supportive in your kitchen in general, above and beyond actually just the recipes. Where do we get that cookbook from? Creative, vegan, easy to make in theory cookbook. That sounds great. So that is, uh, yeah, that is the Leon Fast and Free cookbook. And it's may be, most of them are authored really by a chef. And then John kind of dips in and out of that and writes the introduction and so on. But that is by, oh my God, I'm forgetting her surname, Jane. I'll remember it before the end. But she runs this amazing restaurant down in Dorset. So Jane wrote most of the recipes in Fast and Free. And the other thing though about Jane is she doesn't really measure a lot of stuff and she writes all her recipes down on scraps of paper. So we used to get these brown envelopes full of her scraps of paper recipes in the office and then have to sit there and decipher them and type them up. But yeah, it's a good book. Have I tried Selwyn's? No, I haven't. Someone wants to tell me about it? <clears throat> I'll leave that for after. Whilst that happens, I've got a, a couple other questions that have either come through to me and I've got one of my own, if that's okay. You mentioned about supply chains, restaurant supply chains being disrupted. What will happen to those suppliers if restaurants haven't been paying those? Will they effectively go out of business or? Yeah, they will. And I mean, we, before we even shut our office, 
one of our suppliers and when we say suppliers you know obviously you have suppliers of fresh produce but you also have suppliers who for example mix your recipes um so you know they are more sort of it's not processing because they're still they're frankly still chefs and they're still kitchens but there are um, a lot of places that actually almost could were laying off team even before we shut our office because it's not necessarily about the fact that they their businesses couldn't restart but it is about the fact that if they were not going to have any income over two months they just knew that they wouldn't survive so they wouldn't be able to keep their premises or their team or just the running of it yeah and it's difficult because i think quite a few suppliers may have actually closed early because obviously what happened was um, businesses shut lockdown happened but then the furlough scheme was announced which I think is a bit of a shame because I think there are some businesses that maybe just shut a bit earlier than they might have needed to if they'd actually been able to hang on for the furlough scheme because that obviously has been a real lifeline for a lot of businesses. You mentioned about delivery and other such delivery companies and people being very separated from their food. Is there anything that those can do to make people more conscious, more aware of what is going in food or where food is coming from, do you think? I, yeah, I really do. I really do, actually. I feel that there are just nudges um, that you could you could have. I think you could add on certain filters um, that just encourage people to think about some other criteria for their decision making. Because frankly, like you're at home, and I'm not sometimes sure what the screaming rush needs to be, um, because they just do it. They still purely, really do it on time. And so it just means that as a restaurant, that's you're rushing to be able to make sure that you meet the time that your driver, like your rider comes up to collect the food. And then obviously you want your rider to deliver as fast as possible. If they don't, it reflects on you. But as a platform, I think that they could do better on helping you filter for, you know, either predominantly British produce or, you know, cooked in a certain way or information that will come with my delivery that helps reassure me or help me understand where the food came from. I do also think that there is, there could be ways as well where there's either information sent with the delivery or as a follow up that again, just elaborates a bit more on where the food came from, but it's just sort of so reduced, I think, the kind of rational engagement with the experience. It really is just about the speed and the satiation. Thanks. My personal question, what about all of the sort of the impossible foods and the beyond meats, like the fake meats grown from cells? What do you think will happen with those? Will they get cheap enough or widely accepted enough to, to be used in sort of fast food? Yeah, and I mean, I think a lot of them are um, already being picked up. I think the question probably is there's been such a rush on that and there's been a tremendous amount of um, money invested as well in some of the different offers. I think what's just quite good is actually the more that's happened, the more discerning people are going to become about, well, hang on, actually, does it taste good? And if it tastes good, then maybe where's it from or how was it developed? And so I think what's quite good is that the rush on it is probably just going to mean that there'll be more of a more sort of space created between the offers based on quality which I think can only be a good thing it's a bit like what happened with non-dairy milk to be honest because you know when we uh, first started offering non-dairy I think you know we definitely had soya and nut milks and then you begin to actually look into the genetic modification around the soya and the like the quality options of that and then actually the water use required to produce the nut milks and now we find ourselves, I think, I'm right in saying we offer coconut milk and oat milk. And that's largely to do with quality. Some of it's to do with price, but a lot of it is about realising that not all non-dairy is equal. And so I think that on the meat alternatives, I'm sure it's going to be a similar thing. I hope. Thank you. We've got one more question come through from David Cobb. Um, we've worked from home continuing for some time. Do you see that restaurants moving close to residential areas? as opposed to what we were talking about earlier, just being in the big office concentrations. Yeah, I find, so, I mean, about 10 years ago, I did a master's in sustainability and one of the sort of founding texts of that was Schumacher's Small is Beautiful. And the idea, I think, of a kind of turning back into community groups and community hubs um, and local resilience, 
I think that it is actually very exciting that there's an opportunity um, for people to find more of what they want and need locally and for that to just I don't know give a resurgence on businesses being able to open up or stay open um, and it's actually one of the things that I really love in the beginning of 2040 if anybody's seen it when they talk about energy and I think it's Sol Center um, and the dynamics by which Sol Center works to actually set up local hubs that then connect up to the grid rather than the grid supplying down and I do think that if we can if we can try and dismantle some of the really centralized supply chains um, and logistics businesses that we have in food, then I think that um, local will become really interesting, both for people as customers, the potential of businesses, but also smaller scale, sort of like um, produce suppliers. That's been so interesting. Thank you very much for joining us and answering all of those questions. Thanks um, to Tracer, the connected uh, value chain platform for the diamond industry who have been sponsoring the tech for sustainability series so big thanks to them and yeah thank you so much again to Kirsty and to Leon for uh, giving you to us for an hour um, on your evening so very grateful for your time that's been super super interesting if anybody's got anything that they would want to follow up on please do and I'm particularly interested in how we successfully set up a community of food loving change makers so if anybody has got thoughts on that, references as to other places that have done that sort of thing well, because of course we could do it through loyalty and that would be part of it, but actually it's about bringing together people who'd like to create some change, whether that's in small scale with each of their transactions or through larger um, scale activism.